Final Fantasy V was a landmark title that laid the foundations for some of the best features of the Final Fantasy series. And in many ways, it was a superior game to Final Fantasy IV. But today, Final Fantasy V is remembered mostly as a step in the wrong direction. But I would argue that it wasn't. In this video, I'll show you what the game was like, talk about how the game almost became North America's Final Fantasy III, and explain how Final Fantasy V became a victim of missing nostalgia. Welcome to Final Fantasy's last great adventure. Final Fantasy V was released in Japan on December 6, 1992, about a year and four months after Final Fantasy IV. But unlike the previous game, Final Fantasy V never made it to the West in its original form. And today, it's probably most famous not for its story or gameplay, but for how the game was translated. Final Fantasy IV had been released in North America as Final Fantasy II, and the original plan was to make Final Fantasy V North America's Final Fantasy III. But even though Final Fantasy IV saw decent commercial success and became a cult hit with RPG fans, the game didn't sell nearly as well in the West as Square had hoped. The Super Nintendo was still very new to the American market when Final Fantasy IV was released. Which probably explains why the game didn't sell a ton of copies. But Square took the disappointing sales numbers as a total rejection of the style of intricate Japanese RPGs that had become so popular in their home market. As I explained in my retrospective of Final Fantasy IV, the North American version of the game had been made a lot easier. But in hindsight, Square felt they hadn't gone far enough. Western gamers, they thought, had to be trained in the art of Japanese RPGs before they could tackle another flagship title like Final Fantasy IV. Square's decision was dramatic. Translator Ted Woolsey, who would later become famous for his translation of Final Fantasy VI, had originally been brought on to translate Final Fantasy V into English, and he actually had the whole game pretty much finished when Square decided to cancel the project. Instead, Square took the decision to develop a new game especially for the North American market. A much simpler game that would introduce new players to the general ideas of the JRPG genre, without the complexities that had been built up over the last five years. And they called this game Final Fantasy USA Mystic Quest. Square didn't totally give up on the idea of translating Final Fantasy V. For a while, they kicked around a plan to release it as Final Fantasy Extreme. But it wouldn't be until September of 1999 that Final Fantasy V finally made it to North America and Europe in official form, as part of the Final Fantasy Anthology release for PlayStation 1. But before that could happen, something kind of amazing occurred. Gamers took matters into their own hands and beat Square to the punch. In the mid-90s, few people in the West were even aware that there were Final Fantasy games that had been held back in Japan. It was only when Square decided to give Final Fantasy VII a worldwide release under its original name that gamers started to realize that something was missing. How could a sequel to Final Fantasy III be Final Fantasy VII? Fans started to ask questions about the missing numbers, and the timing could not have been better. Because in 1997, the internet was taking the world by storm and the World Wide Web was the perfect platform for this kind of exploration. Thanks to the internet, people from all over the world could suddenly rally around a common interest, exchanging messages in real time as they discussed their specific passions. So it's really no wonder that people eventually banded together to take on the monumental task of translating RPGs that never made it out of Japan. And among those games, Final Fantasy V was one of the crown jewels. But translating a game like Final Fantasy V would take a lot of work. Back then, no one really knew how to do this sort of thing, and Final Fantasy V was one of the first, if not the first, RPG to be translated this way. It wasn't enough to just translate the text. They had to rewrite a lot of the code to make it work. 
and with no documentation or even best practices to refer to, all they had to go by was trial and error. Final Fantasy V's fan translation, completed in 1998 by Miria, Harmony 7, and with assistance from SOM2 Freak, was a monumental achievement. And when it was done, it spread like wildfire. Soon enough, pretty much every hardcore Final Fantasy fan knew about it. It might be hard to understand today, when it's a foregone conclusion that any mainline Final Fantasy game will get a simultaneous worldwide release. But until that first fan translation was completed, Final Fantasy V was considered a lost game. We knew the game existed, but we also knew for a fact that we would never ever get to play it. So now imagine that you wake up one day and go online, and you suddenly learn there's a new mainline Final Fantasy game waiting to be played, and it's available right now, for free. It felt like winning the lottery. Final Fantasy V's fan translation is probably the most famous and important fan translation of all time. And even though the game was finally given an official English translation in 1999, the fan translation was actually far superior to the work commissioned by Square. It wasn't until the Game Boy Advance version of the game was released in 2006 that Final Fantasy V finally got a professional English translation that was arguably better than what a couple of amateurs managed on their own. Final Fantasy V's fan translation was a powerful demonstration of what the internet could do. It brought like-minded people together, gave us the feeling that all things were possible, and it showed that as long as there were passionate fans out there ready to pour blood, sweat, and tears into it, nothing was off-limits. But above all, the fan translation resurrected a lost Final Fantasy game. And unlike the NES titles, which had already begun to feel dated, this one was still really, really good. When it comes to the game's graphics, Final Fantasy V was a big step up from Final Fantasy IV. Even though both games were built on the same Super Nintendo hardware, Final Fantasy V used twice as much memory as the previous title, and the results speak for themselves. The forest environment where Bartz and Boko make camp at the beginning of the game is lush, lavish, and gorgeously detailed. The houses in the town of Tool are huge, intricate, and sprawl across multiple levels. The architecture looks so much more inviting than before, with richer color, charming designs, and a real fairy tale feel. Interiors are more elaborate too, with detailed curtains and carpets, and the animated water that surrounds Wall's castle is beautiful to behold. Another area that's just as impressive is the game's dungeons. The walls of caves and temples show a lot more texture than before. The ancient library's labyrinthine stacks of bookcases and soaring balconies draw you in with a play of light and shadow and the Barrier Tower's exterior gallery is brought to life by the parallax scrolling of its supporting structure of surrounding columns. Final Fantasy V demonstrates, for the first time in the series, what I would call pixel art. And some of the game's areas have held up so well, they're actually hard to improve on. The view from the cliffs of North Mountain is breathtaking in all of its 16-bit glory. Cloud shadows drift across the mountainside. Pools of light spill from the mouths of caves, and the view from the top is nothing short of amazing. As much as I like the look of the recent Pixel Remaster version of Final Fantasy V, this is one area where the original game actually looks better. Towns and dungeons both got a huge facelift, but they weren't the only things to come out looking better. Major improvements were also made to the game's combat scenes. The least impressive part is probably the enemies you fight. X-Death's design is richer and more colorful than Final Fantasy IV's Galbez, and Final Fantasy V's version of Bahamut is a big step up from the King of Dragons you fought in the previous game, but many of Final Fantasy V's monsters are pretty much comparable to the ones from Final Fantasy IV. The same cannot be said for the battle arenas themselves. The landscapes that form the backdrops for the game's combat sequences are colorful, detailed, and some of them even have a bit of special sauce, 
like the desert, with its distortion effect to simulate a heat haze, and the animated background in the fire-powered ship. There's also a lot more variation in the game's battle scenes, and some of the environments you fight in are really inventive, like the one in the ancient library where you fight on the pages of a gigantic open book. Graphically, Final Fantasy V was a beautiful game, and it still looks charming today. Really, the only thing that's not a step up is the way the world map looks. Forests, mountains, and other terrain is lifted pixel for pixel from Final Fantasy IV, which can feel a bit lazy. And the character sprites used for the top-down scenes of exploration and story are on pretty much the same level as the ones used in the previous game. Something that Final Fantasy V doesn't get nearly enough credit for is its amazing soundtrack. The compositions are vibrant, cheerful, and triumphant, and the quality of the sound is amazing. The main theme of Final Fantasy V, with its synthesized trumpets and rich bass line, is adventurous, uplifting, and bursting with joy. The dungeon theme uses flute and harp sounds along with the mournful sustained note from a synthesizer to immerse you in mystery and suspense. Sealed Away takes those same sounds and adds discordant guitar plucks and cowbell to breathe energy and anticipation into the arrangement. And the final battle uses two separate pieces of music to present an epic, once-in-a-lifetime confrontation that perfectly conveys the desperation of the game's final act, where the heroes put everything on the line to prevent Neo X death from erasing all of existence. But the game's most important track is without a doubt the one that's had the most staying power. It's one of the most beloved, most remixed, most recognizable songs in Final Fantasy's history. Clash on the Big Bridge, with its drums, trumpets, and dancing piano, delivers about as much hype as a 16-bit console could manage without catching on fire. And it deserves to be mentioned on any list of Final Fantasy's best pieces of music. This is also the first game in the series to introduce a great little innovation that makes a big difference in dungeons. For the first time, the background music picks back up where it left off after you exit a battle, so you no longer have to keep listening to the same opening bars over and over again between fights. While Final Fantasy IV had several great compositions, Final Fantasy V's soundtrack is the first in the series that feels like a true accomplishment. It was the most elaborate, varied, and ambitious soundtrack the series had had at that point, and Uematsu said at the time that he wasn't sure he would ever be able to surpass it, which is, of course, a deeply ironic statement, given what Uematsu would achieve with the next game. Visually and musically, Final Fantasy V took what was great about Final Fantasy IV and bumped it up to the next level. But the game's greatest achievement was found at the very heart of the gameplay, and we should first explore the parts that stayed mostly the same. Final Fantasy V is very much what we mean when we talk about classic Japanese RPGs. You control a party of four characters, you fight monsters in random encounters to gain experience and gold, buy spells and equipment in towns to make the hero stronger, and explore different dungeons to find treasure and defeat powerful boss encounters to advance the story. You explore a vast overworld that connects the game's different towns, dungeons, and other locations. And in this case, it's divided into three separate worlds, which you'll discover one after the other. The game is still a mostly linear experience, but as you get deeper into the story and unlock more advanced modes of transportation like the Wind Dragon, the Airship, and the Submarine, you'll have more and more freedom to explore. And Final Fantasy V has more secrets and optional content than any of the previous games in the series. While the basic concept stays very close to the formula set down in the first four games, Final Fantasy V feels like a much more polished product. Battles run smoother than ever, and commanding the characters feels a lot more responsive. There's still a huge number of random encounters, 
but the way they're distributed feels a lot more fair than in Final Fantasy IV. And navigating the game's menus is so much faster. Organizing your party feels like much less of a chore. Final Fantasy V was the first in the series to introduce a key feature we now take for granted. The equipment menu got an optimized function that automatically outfits the character with the strongest available weapons and armor for their job. It's not perfect, but it's a great option to have. You now also get to see how a weapon or armor will affect your stats before you equip it, and that's a pretty big deal. Key items you get from the story are now kept in a separate tab in the inventory, instead of clogging up space in your general loot. You can finally spam healing spells without having to recast a spell or reselect a target. And there's a beginner's hall in the first town which does a great job of explaining many of the game's fundamental concepts. And this is also where you'll find Final Fantasy's first true tutorial, an in-depth explanation of how the game's job system works. Final Fantasy V also introduced the option to dash in towns and dungeons, though you have to use a thief to unlock this ability. Even though Final Fantasy V didn't have a lot of big innovations, the game made tons of tiny improvements to the Final Fantasy experience, to the point where the game feels super playable, even today. And the greatest contribution Final Fantasy V made to the series as a whole was in how it upgraded its most important feature. The big central thing that Final Fantasy V is most famous for. In some ways, Final Fantasy V can be seen as a direct reaction to the most controversial change made in Final Fantasy IV. Final Fantasy III was a very popular game in Japan and its heavy focus on exploration, adventure, and party customization was a recipe for success. And its most potent ingredient was the first introduction of Final Fantasy's now famous job system. Final Fantasy IV's focus on story and character and the introduction of the outstanding new active time battle for combat might seem like a slam dunk, but the game also severely cut down on player choice and party customization. With fixed jobs for every character and a party composition dictated by the story, there just weren't a lot of choices left for the player to make. And after getting a taste of the freedom offered by the first three games, some fans would have seen this as a big step back. With Final Fantasy V, Square showed that they were paying attention to player feedback. The game's crowning glory is its upgraded version of Final Fantasy III's job system. Just like in the third game, Final Fantasy V's heroes have no unique skills or abilities, and their attributes are all the same at the start. But that all changes when you unlock your first batch of jobs. After receiving the Blessing of the Wind Crystal, you can switch a character's job through the game's menu at any time, as long as you're not in a fight. Different jobs are good at different things, can equip different weapons and armor, and most importantly, each job also comes with one or more unique abilities. The Black Mage can use black magic, the Knight can shield vulnerable allies from physical damage, and the Thief can steal items from monsters. The heroes start a game as freelancers, a neutral job with no special talents or flaws, except for the ability to equip any weapon or armor in the game. But they can change into one of six jobs after clearing the Wind Shrine. You get five more jobs from the Water Crystal, another five from the Fire Crystal, although two of them are only unlocked after reaching the Town of Crescent, and four jobs from the Earth Crystal. Finally, there's one more secret job, the Mime, which you'll get for completing a hidden dungeon near the end of the game. This adds up to 22 different jobs, the exact same number as in Final Fantasy III. But Final Fantasy V is so much more than just a copy and paste of the original job system. As I said in my retrospective of Final Fantasy III, the first version of the job system was a lot of fun, but it also had some serious design flaws. On their second try, Square took the lessons they had learned and used them to create a much better system. 12 of Final Fantasy III's 22 jobs make a return in Final Fantasy V, 
Knight, Bard, Ranger and Monk, White, Black and Red Mage, Thief, Geomancer, Summoner, Ninja and Dragoon. While some of these jobs were already powerful or at least useful, other jobs got much needed upgrades to weak or situational abilities. The Geomancer's terrain ability no longer backfires on a miss, gives access to a larger variety of effects for each terrain type and can be incredibly powerful depending on where you are in the game. The Thief went from something of a joke to a Swiss army knife of useful abilities. They can dash in towns and dungeons, reveal hidden passages, prevent back attacks and strike first in combat. And the Steel Command is actually worthwhile this time around, since some of the game's monsters and bosses hold seriously valuable stuff. Other jobs were removed from the lineup, or replaced with something that better fit the new design philosophy. Since all jobs were meant to be different but equal, direct upgrades like the Black Belt, Devout and Magus were ripped out. And on the opposite end, the Warrior and the Evoker also got cut, since they were weaker and less interesting versions of the Knight and the Summoner. Because ridiculous master jobs had no place in the new and improved system, the Sage, an absolutely absurd combination of White Mage, Black Mage and Summoner, got slashed. The Ninja survived, but with a serious nerf. It's no longer the ultimate powerhouse from Final Fantasy III, but rather a niche fighter with a much more interesting toolkit. This spring cleaning of the job system left room for a bunch of really interesting new jobs. The Time Mage wields magic that manipulates time and space with spells like Haste, Slow and Teleport. The Beastmaster can turn the strength of monsters against their own allies. The Chemist combines special ingredients into a host of unique and powerful effects and the Mime duplicates the actions of other characters without having to pay MP or consume items. But the most creative of Final Fantasy V's new jobs is the one with the most dynamic ability. A game mechanic that's gone on to become one of Final Fantasy's most iconic recurring features and a huge fan favorite. An amazing idea that began with a simple question. What if the heroes could use the abilities of monsters against them? Blue magic was first introduced in Final Fantasy V and it started as a bit of a joke. One of the designers who worked on monster data for Final Fantasy IV suggested that it might be funny if the heroes could use enemy abilities like Death Sentence on the enemies themselves. But as the team brainstormed ideas for the new game, they realized they'd accidentally hit upon a really great idea. Blue mages are spellcasters, but the way they master magic comes with a big twist. After being hit with a certain special attack used by a monster in combat, the blue mage masters that ability as a spell and can use it in future battles. There's a total of 30 different blue magic spells scattered across Final Fantasy V's worlds, so the blue mage has a lot of potential, but finding them all takes commitment. Mastering each new spell is almost like a mini quest of its own. The Dorn Chimera can teach you Aqua Breath, but challenging this deadly monster on your first trip to the ancient library could get you killed. White Wind can be learned from the Enchanted Fan, but only if you use the Beastmaster's control ability to take command of its movements. And you can pick up Flash super early at North Mountain, but only if you're willing to feed a precious ether to one of the headstone enemies. It's no coincidence that the Blue Mage is one of the first jobs you receive when you reach the Wind Crystal. Blue magic isn't something that's reserved for the end game. You're meant to explore the mechanic throughout the game, from the very first dungeon to the final battle. And blue magic is more than just a diversion. It's also ridiculously overpowered. White wind can provide massive healing for your whole party and ignores reflect. Big guard slaps protect, shell and float on all the four heroes, making most encounters trivial. And level five death kills every enemy on the screen if their level is a multiple of five. That sounds situational until you realize that Dark Spark and Level 2 Old can change an enemy's level. With just the right amount of mathematics 
you can instant kill almost every boss in the game. Blue magic is pretty much my favorite Final Fantasy thing of all time. But as cool as the blue mage is, there is still one other job in Final Fantasy V that has greater potential. And it's the one you'd least expect. But to explain what makes this job so interesting, we first must talk about the single most important upgrade Final Fantasy V made to the job system. In Final Fantasy III, characters who stayed in the same role gained job levels by defeating enemies. But it was really nothing to get too excited about. Higher job levels made you stronger in combat, but you never gained any new abilities or interesting upgrades. Final Fantasy V changed this formula for the better by introducing the ability system. Each time a character earns enough ability points from combat to increase the job level of their currently equipped job, they learn a new ability. Some are passive abilities, like the Knight's Two-Handed, which lets you wield a single weapon in both hands for extra power, while others are command abilities, like the Monk's Chakra, which restores some of the character's hit points and removes certain debuffs. The ability system even lets you learn the job's signature ability, like the White Mage's White Magic or the Dragoon's Jump. And that's kind of the whole point, because Final Fantasy V's ability system lets you equip the abilities you've already mastered while using another job. And this game is all about mixing and matching different jobs and abilities to create new and exciting combinations, like a Dragoon that can use blue magic, or a knight that can steal items from monsters. And with 4 characters, 22 jobs to unlock, and 74 unique abilities to master, the number of combinations you could experiment with is pretty much infinite. The ability system means you no longer have to commit to a single job, just to gain access to a part of its skill set. The Geomancer isn't the strongest job, but as a backup, its terrain ability is one of the most versatile tools in the game. The Beastmaster's weapon selection is limited, but if you stick with it long enough, you'll master Control, one of the most broken command abilities there is. And even the most situational jobs, like the Chemist or the Bard, can easily hold their own when you give them a strong option like Black Magic or the Barehanded ability, which puts them on par with a Monk for unarmed attacks. Even though some of the game's jobs are definitely worse than others, they all have something that's worth learning. The Ranger's Rapid Fire lets you attack four times instead of one, although each attack hits a random target and does half damage. The Red Mage rewards patient players with dual cast, which lets you cast two spells with a single action. And Mastering the Dancer gives you the option to equip the Ribbon, a godlike accessory that grants immunity to all harmful effects. But the true potential of the ability system only comes into play when you consider how it impacts the game's most interesting job. The one you had all along. The Freelancer. While Final Fantasy III's starting job, the Onion Knight, held amazing potential for players who were willing to power level well beyond what was needed to comfortably finish the game. For the vast majority of players, it became irrelevant the moment you reached the Wind Crystal and picked up your first set of real jobs. But Final Fantasy V's freelancer job was designed to stay relevant. Even though the freelancer doesn't have any unique skills of its own, it grows stronger as you level up other jobs. Not only can the freelancer equip any two of your mastered abilities, it also inherits the attribute bonuses from all of your mastered jobs, and gets the benefit of all of their starting passive abilities without having to equip them. That doesn't mean much at the start of the game, but towards the end, switching to the freelancer could give you a character who can dual wield like a ninja, dash and reveal hidden passages like a thief, cover allies in combat like a knight, counterattack like a monk, and dodge traps like the Geomancer. And all of this while wielding the game's most powerful weapons and spells. Where Final Fantasy IV made the conscious decision to restrict player choice in order to serve up a stronger story, Final Fantasy V's updated job system offers more freedom in party customization than ever before. Individual dungeons and specific monsters are easier to handle with certain jobs and abilities but there's always a ton of solutions to any problem, 
where Final Fantasy III had a tendency to force the player into specific setups. Final Fantasy V is more about choosing your own path. Aside from the changes we've already mentioned, the game made four very welcome improvements to the job system. The first of these is the removal of the restrictions on job switching. Final Fantasy III gave you capacity points for defeating monsters, and kept you from switching jobs if you didn't have enough of them. This mechanic discouraged experimentation, so Final Fantasy V simply got rid of it. You can now switch jobs whenever you want without limitation. The second improvement is a matter of increased convenience. In Final Fantasy III, you had to manually remove a character's gear before you could change their job. But in Final Fantasy V, characters are automatically stripped when you make the change. And the best available equipment for the new job is then applied through the Optimize feature. Unfortunately, you have to go through this process even if you only switch abilities, and the game isn't smart enough to recognize that the weapon or armor with the highest attack or defense isn't always the best choice, but it sure beats having to do everything yourself. The third improvement is related, and it has to do with how the game handles items. Final Fantasy III's inventory could only fit 32 different items, and this super limited space meant you just couldn't afford to carry around all sorts of weapons and armor just in case you wanted to experiment with new jobs. Sure, you could leave extra stuff with the fat chocobo, but that stash wasn't available in dungeons, so you could really only change your setup in town. Final Fantasy V's massive inventory is large enough to last you the whole game, which means you never have to make tough choices about what to carry around. And the fat chocobo, which was no longer needed, was removed from the game. Finally, the game made some important changes to magic. In Final Fantasy III, only spellcasters had magic points, so switching from a knight to a black mage in the middle of a dungeon meant you couldn't cast any spells until you could restore your MP. And since the game had no save points or ethers to drink, the only way to do that was to rest at an inn, or burn one of the game's super rare elixirs. In Final Fantasy V, all jobs have at least decent MP, and the addition of save points in dungeons and shops that sell ethers means you can fill it back up without heading to town. These changes and more make the job system a lot more permissive. You now have a ton of options that just weren't available in Final Fantasy III. You can turn your monk into a white mage between battles just to heal up. You can swap in a time mage just to buff your party with float before fighting a boss. Or you can make your summoner spam Ifrit and Shiva until you're out of MP, then make them a knight and just hit things with swords until you reach the next save point. It's all incredibly modular, and there are so many tiny little ways you could tweak your party. Not all combinations are great matches, but you never know when a weird mix might come in handy. And that's the beauty of Final Fantasy V's job system. It offers up a treasure chest of possibilities, but never forces you down any one road or suggests how you should be playing the game. There's really no wrong way to play Final Fantasy V, and that's a great thing. Final Fantasy V's version of the job system was a huge improvement, and it made a big impact on the part of the game where you spend most of your time. From a modern perspective, Final Fantasy V's combat system looks pretty basic, but at the time it was new, it was a huge leap forward, and by far the most fun way to fight in a Final Fantasy game. The magic happened when the updated job system met the greatest innovation from Final Fantasy IV. Because, as it turned out, these two ideas worked incredibly well together. In my retrospective of Final Fantasy IV, I talked a lot about the innovative active time battle system, which combined the strategic elements of a turn-based system with the real-time excitement of an action game. Although Final Fantasy IV's implementation of A to B was far from perfect, the core idea was brilliant. Final Fantasy V took that great foundation and made it better and the single biggest improvement was a very simple change. The heart of ATB is the real-time component, where some characters act faster than others depending on their speed. But in Final Fantasy IV, there was really no way to tell when a character's turn would come up, 
and that made it hard to plan ahead. Final Fantasy V solved this by implementing the ATB bar, a visual representation of how long you'll have to wait until each character's next turn. This simple change adds a ton of strategic depth to the combat, since you can now choose your actions with much more precision. It might seem like a small thing, but it really makes a huge difference. Battles also run a lot faster than before. In Final Fantasy IV, different actions had different execution speeds. Healing magic was fast, while summoning spells took forever to work. This feature was meant to add meaningful choices, but as interesting as the idea was, it made the combat system feel sluggish. You just ended up spending a lot of your time in combat waiting for things to happen, and reacting to the enemy's actions could sometimes be very hard. Final Fantasy V got rid of this mechanic, and the characters now act lightning fast. Combat feels a lot more responsive, and fights run much faster, so you end up spending more time making decisions and less time waiting to see how they turn out. And with respect to Final Fantasy IV, there is a lot more strategy involved in combat this time around. Many combat encounters can be either ridiculously hard or incredibly easy depending on how well you adapt to the situation. The Enchanted Fan uses White Wind to heal its allies, so you gotta take them out first. Better yet, use the Beastmaster's control ability and you'll have an endless supply of healing for the rest of the fight. Crew Dust blinds your whole party with Flash if they're ever alone on the battlefield, so you'll want to wipe them all out at once with powerful magic. And the Kusa Beast hits harder and harder the more damage it's taken, so this is the time to use that instant kill ability. No matter how hard a battle gets or how unfair a monster feels, there's always a way to work around it. The Sandcrawler, fought in the desert surrounding the Mughal forest, is meant to be an impossible fight by the time you first get there, but it's super weak to Aqua Breath, giving you an honest chance if you want to take it on anyway. With all the abilities, spells, and equipment you could play around with, the job system gives you a thousand paths to victory. And because there are so many options to try, the solution you come up with feels like something you invented on your own, not something the game told you to do. And this is especially true when it comes to the game's most important battles. Just like the previous game, Final Fantasy V has a tutorial boss that's designed to help teach you active time battle. The Wing Raptor. Strike while its wings are open and you're fine. But attack when its wings are closed and you're in for a world of hurt. And since the Wing Raptor also has the powerful Breath Wing attack that hits your whole party, the time the boss spends with its wings closed is the perfect opportunity to use those healing potions you picked up at the start of the dungeon. The Wing Raptor does a great job of teaching the basics, and while Final Fantasy IV's tutorial battle against the Mist Dragon is pretty much impossible to lose, ignoring the Wing Raptor's special mechanic could actually result in a game over. This is a useful lesson to learn, because Final Fantasy V's boss monsters are a lot more difficult than ever before. Siren, who ambushes the heroes in the ship graveyard, hits hard, and she keeps shifting between a living form and an undead form, forcing you to adapt as the battle goes on. The Dragon Pod of Drakenvale is harmless on its own, but defeating it means playing whack-a-mole with its dragon flowers while you deal with the root of the problem. And the Living Fire, fought in the fire-powered ship, has three different forms that all react differently to your actions and the fight can seem literally impossible if you fail to pick up on what's going on. But once you get the hang of it, it's super easy. But the boss that really sells Final Fantasy V's job system, and shows you just how much fun it can be, is the one you don't even have to fight. In fact, if you're not playing with a guide, there's a good chance you won't even find it. Hidden in the depths of castle walls, Shiva is the game's first optional boss. As a summoned monster, she can be a seriously powerful tool, especially if you pick her up early. But getting Shiva on your side means beating her in a fight, and that can be a real challenge if you try to do it as soon as you can. At level 10, it's a brutal fight, but it's also incredibly fun. This time, I went through 5 different setups before I managed to limp my way to victory. 
And I'm still not sure my all-caster lineup of Black Mage, Summoner, Thai Mage and White Mage was anywhere near ideal. But that's the whole point. Battles like these, where you have to experiment with different setups, try new tactics and work hard for the victory, are the reason why the game's job system is so much fun. In Final Fantasy V, there's always another option to try. And the result is that different players are gonna have a different experience with the game. But what I love about Final Fantasy V is just how much freedom it gives you to totally break the game. The fight with Galura in Wall's Tower is a total cakewalk if you picked up the Flash Bell at North Mountain. The Tyrannosaur can be killed with a single Phoenix down. And the power of level 5 death is pretty much only limited by your math skills. Final Fantasy V is one of the earliest examples of one of the main reasons I love Japanese RPGs. It's the heavy emphasis the games place on deep party customization, the amount of time you can sink into the game's menus, and the fact that the choices you make actually matter a lot. And nowhere in the game is this more true than in Final Fantasy V's amazing final battle. Neo X Death is an absolute spectacle of a fight, a hideous amalgamation of flesh from your worst nightmares, a fully animated backdrop, a high intensity soundtrack, the shaking of the screen as Neo X Death hammers you with its unique array of horrifying ultimate attacks unlike anything you've faced before. Delta Attack, Almagest, Grand Cross and Vacuum Wave. And the fact that the boss is divided into four separate parts that all act on their own. It's disorienting, frightening and absolutely captivating. And Neo X Death is hard. It's the perfect test on all that you've learned so far. A fight that asks more from you than any of the final bosses from the first four games. And it serves as a great capstone to the job system. With everything on the line, now is the time for you to decide. What is your ultimate party? What's the most powerful team you can put on the field when your back is against the wall? And this is where Final Fantasy V's job system really shines. Because there is no one way to beat Neo X Death, just a thousand different methods, each one unique to a different player. A personal, custom made experience. A great way to end a great game that's all about player choice. But Final Fantasy V is not just about the battles you fight, it's also about the journey you make between them. So it's important to talk about the two other areas where Final Fantasy V really stepped up its game. And the first of these is the environment where most of the journey takes place. Final Fantasy V's dungeons are a huge improvement over the previous game. I already talked about how beautiful they look, but there is also more complexity to their design. Wall's Tower has vine-covered pillars you can climb to reach isolated areas, and rewards your understanding of the dungeon's architecture with additional treasure. The ship graveyard is filled with thick mist, water-logged wrecks and stepping stones to jump across, forcing you to engage your critical thinking to figure out how to proceed. And the fire-powered ship is a jumble of ladders to climb and pipes to crawl through, and has enough elevators, catwalks and conveyor belts to spin your head right around. It's not a very long dungeon, and finding the path forward isn't all that hard to do, but getting all of the dungeon's treasure means making sense of a deliberately confusing environment, and that feels a lot like real exploration. The game's dungeons go for quality over quantity, and most of them are pretty short by JRPG standards. But even more importantly, Final Fantasy V's dungeons are all about variety. Some are simple and straightforward, like the Wind Shrine or Wall's Tower. Others are more about problem solving, like the fire-powered ship or the desert of shifting sands. And then you have big sprawling mazes like the Ronka Ruins or the Great Pyramid of Mua, which feel almost like a callback to something out of Final Fantasy I, but with much better design. This variety keeps the game's dungeons from ever becoming too tedious, but Final Fantasy V also uses a ton of cool ideas to keep its dungeons interesting. The fire-powered ship has a puzzle room near the end where you have to pull levers to operate platforms that form the way forward. In the underground waterway, you are swept along the river 
and have to fight back-to-back -back battles without using the menu. In one room of the Great Pyramid, the enemies move around on the screen and you can avoid combat altogether if you're quick on your feet. And the Fork Tower forces you to split your party into two separate teams and take on the dungeon from different directions. But Final Fantasy V's most dynamic dungeon is the one that features the biggest innovation. A game mechanic that adds a ton of energy and urgency to the experience. After making their way through the fire-powered ship and defeating its boss, the four heroes find themselves in the basement of a Karnak castle that is minutes away from being consumed by fire. Having to fight your way back out of a dungeon while a timer ticks down to your death is an incredibly tense experience, and trying to leave the castle with as much loot as possible forces a ton of interesting decisions. It's a great design that's unlike anything from the previous four games. Final Fantasy V has some of the most memorable dungeons in the Final Fantasy series, and the best of them all might just be the one right at the end. In the game's final dungeon, the Interdimensional Rift, the heroes explore an epic extraplanar space that contains pieces of all of the places X-Death has sucked into the void. It's full of things to see, amazing treasure to find, and an endless parade of interesting bosses to fight. It's the most elaborate, exciting, and engaging endgame the series has seen at this point, and it's probably still my favorite final dungeon in the series. The dungeons of Final Fantasy V are still old school experiences, but their design was a huge step in the right direction, and the game's focus on variation and subverting the player's expectations laid the foundation for the kind of crazy non-standard dungeons we'd see in Final Fantasy VI's Phantom Train or the Shinra building from Final Fantasy VII. And as an example of what classic dungeon design can offer, Final Fantasy V has honestly held up incredibly well. Which can also be said for the other of the two areas where Final Fantasy V made great strides. Like many classic JRPGs, Final Fantasy V takes place on an overworld that connects its individual locations. And exploring the world of Final Fantasy V is pretty much the same experience as in the previous games. There's towns and dungeons to find, random encounters to survive, and vehicles to acquire that unlock new areas of the world. And even the game's big twist, the revelation that there's a whole other world out there to explore, had already been done before by both Final Fantasy III and Final Fantasy IV. But there is one thing that sets Final Fantasy V's world building apart, and that's how it all fits together. Because this game doesn't just have multiple separate worlds to explore, its worlds are pieces of a greater puzzle, and when you put them together, something magical happens. Final Fantasy V's story seems to take place in two different worlds, but the big twist is that they're actually one and the same. In the distant past, to prevent a cataclysmic disaster, the world of Final Fantasy V was split into two. Bart's world, where the story begins, and Galef's world, where the heroes find themselves after chasing after the game's villain, X-Death. But after an epic confrontation at the heart of X-Death's castle, the villain invokes the power of the elemental crystals to merge the two worlds back into one. The original world restored. By merging its two worlds, the game does more than simply give you a new environment to explore. It also breeds new life into places you've already been. There's so many locations in the two worlds that only become relevant after the worlds merge. Bards' world has the island shrine, a temple surrounded by mountains on a remote island in the middle of the ocean. But combine it with the big bridge from Galef's world, and you now have one of the game's final dungeons. An underwater cave in Galef's world leads to a hidden forest with some optional rewards. But in the merged world, it becomes the entrance to the watery dungeon of Istri Falls. But the coolest example of the game's puzzle piece world design is in how it handles the location of one of its most iconic summoned monsters. Jakul Cave is an optional dungeon in Bartz's world. It's a fun little side trek with some interesting treasure and a unique gimmick. There's more than one way in, 
Enter from the front and you'll have to solve a puzzle and fight your way through multiple screens to reach the rewards. But wait until you have the airship and you can raid the dungeon from the back. It's a fun place to explore and a great way to earn some serious ability points before leaving the first world. But the cave's true potential only becomes apparent when the worlds combine. Castle Ball is a key location in Galif's world. It's mainly a town and it features heavily in the story, but it also has a small dungeon area in the castle's basement. There's not much to this place when you first find it. Just a single room with a sealed door and the chance to farm some very rewarding monsters. But again, the dungeon's true potential has yet to be seen. Jakul Cave and Castle Ball are two pieces of a puzzle, and when the worlds merge, they slot together as one. What was once a clever way to collect Jakul Cave's treasure now becomes the back entrance to Castle Ball's basement, and heroes who follow this path can reach the depths of the castle dungeons and challenge its legendary summoned monster, Odin. Final Fantasy V is full of these clever connections that only make sense when the two worlds combine. There's all sorts of compelling landmarks that build anticipation for future adventures, and the merged world gives you plenty of chances to experience familiar locations in a different context. At the same time, the strength of the game's merged world design really comes down to one key factor. Final Fantasy V has more secrets to reveal than ever before. Final Fantasy V was the first in the series to establish a Final Fantasy standard, a mostly linear experience that opens up like a flower right before the endgame, revealing a world full of optional content. By the time you reach the merged world, your first real task after reassembling your party is to take on the Great Pyramid of Mua. In theory, the Great Pyramid is the first of five endgame dungeons you're expected to complete before confronting X-Death. But what some players might not even realize is that the other four dungeons are entirely optional. Although the Island Shrine, Fork Tower, Istri Falls, and the Great Sea Trench all unlock powerful weapons, spells, and other amazing rewards, none of this is needed to finish the game. Once you beat the Great Pyramid and recover the airship, you can head straight for the interdimensional rift to face X-Death. You'll have a pretty rough time, especially at first, but nothing's stopping you from trying. But even players who collect all the four tablets to unlock the 12 legendary weapons before tackling the final dungeon still have tons of secrets to find if they're hungry for more. You can climb the Phoenix Tower, challenge Bahamut at North Mountain, and get the mime job from the Sunken Tower of Walls. You can track down the mythical town of Mirage, finish off your collection of blue magic spells, and hunt down weapons that put the 12 legendary weapons to shame. And if you still haven't had enough of the game, there's always Final Fantasy's very first super bosses. While earlier games in the series had tough optional encounters, like Bahamut and Odin, none of them were really comparable to the game's final boss. Final Fantasy V's two most lethal monsters, Shinryu and Omega, are found in the Interdimensional Rift, and they're both so powerful, they make Neo X Death look like a joke. Showing up unprepared is a guaranteed wipe, and getting the win takes a lot of work. Far more work than the average player would ever put in. And that's exactly the point. What was new about the superbosses was the overpowering challenge they offered, which served as a motivation to keep you playing well past the end of the story. And it was the perfect incentive for a game like Final Fantasy V. While this is a relatively short JRPG by today's standards, finding all of its secrets and fully mastering the game's job system is a huge undertaking. And by the time that you're done, there's really nothing but the game's two super bosses that could put up a fight. Final Fantasy V was really the first game in the series to have a proper endgame. But the game's many secrets aren't all found at the end. Many are there right from the start. After you rescue the Wind Drake from North Mountain, 
You can fly it all the way back to Castle Tycoon for a bonus cutscene between Faris and Lena, and one of the game's most overpowered pieces of gear in the healing staff. After getting the fire-powered ship, you can sail around the continent to find the town of Istory and challenge the summoned monster Ramu in the forest nearby. And once you have the black chocobo, you can cross the mountains to reach the village of Lix, which happens to be Bart's hometown. When it comes to the sheer wealth of the game's content, Final Fantasy V stands far above the four previous games. There's just a ton of things to discover, and the game does a great job of always making you feel like there's more to be found. Final Fantasy V has so many secrets, even after all these years and multiple playthroughs, I'm still finding new things every time I play. And for a game that came out in 1992, that's a pretty cool thing. Having talked about Final Fantasy V's greatest strengths, it's only fair that we should take a look at the part of the game that's usually regarded as the worst thing about it. The area where the game's predecessor, Final Fantasy IV, made such great strides, and where Final Fantasy V has a reputation for coming up short. Final Fantasy V tells the story of Bartz, Lena, Galof, and Faris, four strangers who are drawn into adventure when the world's elemental crystals are threatened by an unknown force. The heroes are chosen by the crystals as the warriors of light, and go on a quest to prevent the resurrection of an ancient evil. A common criticism of Final Fantasy V is that its story is weak, and the game is often described as a more light-hearted, less serious story than Final Fantasy IV. But when you look at what actually happens in Final Fantasy V, you'll see that the story is just as gripping, if not more so, than any of the games that came before. Sildra's death after saving the heroes from the sinking Tower of Walls is a beautiful moment. The story of how Lena's father refused to butcher the last living Windrake to save his wife is extremely touching, and the flashback that shows Bart's mother passing away from an illness is seriously the saddest scene in any of the games up until this point. A lot of characters die in this game, and unlike Final Fantasy IV, there are no fake-out deaths this time around. People who die stay dead. And I haven't even mentioned the game's best death scene, which I'll get to later. The stakes are incredibly high, and the Warriors of Light are always one step behind. X death sinks a whole island just to keep the heroes from talking to Sage Guido, burns the great forest of Mua to the ground to smoke the heroes out, and unleashes the power of the Void to annihilate entire cities. X death's power is impossible to ignore, and when the heroes recover the airship in the merged world, the villain's answer is immediate and brutal. He commands the Void to rip Bart's hometown out of existence. It's such a knife to the heart, and Bart's outburst of impotent rage is a very human reaction. The fact of the matter is that it was never the developer's intention to make Final Fantasy V a light-hearted story. Rather, they wanted to tell a dramatic tale that ran the full range of emotions. And Yoshinori Kitase, the man who would later go on to serve as director of Final Fantasy VI, said at the time that his role was mainly to inject spots of comic relief to lighten a relatively serious story. But I would argue that the main reason Final Fantasy V's story seems to fall flat for so many people is not because of its humor, and it's not because the story was less ambitious or more light-hearted than the one in Final Fantasy IV. Rather, it has to do with what happens to the game's characters when they're exposed to Final Fantasy V's best feature, the job system. It tends to be the case that we get our strongest impressions of who a character is from what they do. After all, actions speak louder than words, and this is especially important in a 16-bit game. There's only so much you can do to express a character's personality when you're limited to tiny sprites and basic dialogue with no voice acting. Final Fantasy IV's characters were so memorable in spite of these limitations because their identities were conveyed through the game itself. Dark Knight Cecil is terribly strong, but his dark sword is useless against evil. 
Rydia is fragile, but she commands magic that can shake the heavens. And Rosa is a healer, a person whose every action is in the service of other people. But the point of Final Fantasy V's job system is that its heroes are blank slates for you to shape as you wish. So this characterization through gameplay is something the game doesn't have. So you never get a good sense for who the characters actually are. But that's not even the worst part of it. Because Final Fantasy V's heroes are missing something even more important. If you ask me, the best characters from Final Fantasy IV were Cecil, Kane, and Rydia. And they all drew their strength from the personal stories they had to tell. Each of these heroes had their own demons to fight, and they grew and changed over the course of the story. The Cecil who stole the water crystal from Mesidia at the very beginning was not the same man as the Cecil who faced the ultimate evil at the end of the game. He was a great character because he had a great character arc. Final Fantasy V's heroes don't really have that. They all seem fine the way they are, and aside from a moment of doubt here and there, their convictions are never really tested. At the end of the journey, they're pretty much the same people they were at the start. But that doesn't mean the game has a bad story. Ultimately, Final Fantasy V is not so much a gripping drama as it is a swashbuckling tale of adventure. It's more Jumanji than The Shawshank Redemption. And while it might not have as much staying power as Final Fantasy VI or even Final Fantasy IV, there's a lot here to love. For the first time in the series, the heroes actually feel like a traveling band of companions. There's a bunch of neat little character interactions that add depth to the story, like the scene where Bartz and Galof share a drink in the village of Rugar after reuniting in the second world. And it's no coincidence that Final Fantasy V is the first game in the series where each character gets their own bed when you rest at an inn, instead of all piling into a single bunk. Final Fantasy V is where the series first began to break the mold of the classic JRPG formula. The scenarios are creative and diverse, and no two locations ever feel the same. It's also an incredibly dynamic story. Within the first 20 minutes of the game, You've seen a meteor crash, rescued a princess from goblins, survived an earthquake, and tried to steal a pirate ship. And that's just to get you started. Every dungeon feels like an adventure. At North Mountain, the heroes are ambushed by bounty hunters, and Faris has to leap across a chasm to save Lena. At the Barrier Tower, the heroes rendezvous with an allied fleet at sea, fight a battle on the backs of ships, and then infiltrate the tower from below by submarine. And to reach the Earth Crystal, the heroes revive an ancient flying fortress slumbering beneath the desert, disable its mechanical defenses with their airship, and plunge inside its high-tech interior to reveal its forgotten secrets. But all of this is just to whet your appetite for the game's most exciting set-piece scenario. When the heroes make the leap to the second world, it kicks off a super exciting sequence of events. The heroes arrive on a solitary island, but are soon abducted by monsters and taken to X Death's castle. Learning of the fate of his friends from the other world, Galef mounts a solo rescue, which turns into a dramatic escape and a running battle that ends with the heroes being blown quite literally to another continent. Even today, this whole setup feels incredibly exciting, and it's a real kick in the pants to the game's story. Just as the journey was starting to feel a little bit stale, suddenly everything feels fresh again. A new world stretches out before you, waiting to be found. And since Final Fantasy V has three worlds, you get to experience this feeling of freedom three times. Simply put, the game has a lot of story to tell. When Final Fantasy V was released, the development team estimated that it had four times as many story events as in Final Fantasy IV. And the scenes that play out are so much richer than in the previous games. There's a lot more dialogue, a lot more character interaction, and the heroes themselves are much more expressive. Final Fantasy V also did something the previous games never did. It introduced a bunch of optional story scenes that helped flesh out the characters. 
There's a great moment between Faris and Barts at his mother's grave if you visit the village of Lix. Faris and Lena make a shocking discovery about each other if you make an early detour to Castle Tycoon. And if you go see Faris on the second floor of the pub in the village of Thul, you get a hilarious scene where Barts and Galuf end up questioning their sexuality. And sure, the story does have a lot of funny moments. The scene in the pirate ship's brig where Galuf wonders who had the bright idea to steal a pirate ship even though he was the one to suggest it always makes me laugh. I love the scene where Sid tries to blast his way out of his prison cell only to end up making a hole into the hero's cell. And while there are only five heroes who officially joined the party, I gotta give a shout out to Gilgamesh, everyone's favorite goofball evil henchman who goes from a loyal subject of X-Death to a weird sort of ally. From the very first meeting in X-Death's castle to his final sacrifice in the interdimensional rift, Gilgamesh's unique brand of goofy humor and good-natured bravado is a constant source of entertainment. Final Fantasy V story might seem pretty basic today, but it's full of great little twists and amazing surprises. Some of the game's best secrets, like the true nature of X-Death or his plan to merge the two worlds into one, are wild enough that you'd never guess them without a guide. And while by now we've seen way too many badass pirate ladies to ever be surprised to learn that Ferris is actually a woman, back in 1992, it would have come as a shock. By today's standards, of course the story has many flaws. The villain is deliciously evil and hilariously fun, but his motivations make no sense at all. And the deranged revelation that X-Death began his life as a tree really should have come as a plot twist in the Great Forest of Mua and not just a bit of trivia thrown out by Sage Gido. Some of the game's storylines, like Faris losing Sildra, would have hit harder if they'd been given some time to breathe. It would have been nice to get to know King Zessa a bit more before he sacrificed himself at the Barrier Tower. And the meteors Galuf and his allies used to travel between worlds is such a cool concept, but they're never explained or even mentioned again after you leave the first world. Seriously, where did those things come from? But these are all minor problems. And the fact of the matter is that 30 years ago, when this game was brand new, there really wasn't anything like it on 16-bit consoles. And for all its funny moments and light-hearted scenes, the heart of Final Fantasy V is a story of courage, friendship, and the unshakable bonds that grow between siblings in arms. It's a story with some incredibly touching moments. And the best of them all, the one that stays with me forever, is Galuf's last stand. Galuf's battle with X-Death in the Great Forest of Mua forms the very highlight of the game's story. After powering his way through a force field to save his granddaughter Kryl, Galuf confronts X-Death alone. And the villain throws everything he's got at the hero. Flare, Holy, Meteor. A relentless barrage of the game's most powerful spells should be enough to reduce any adventuring party to dust. And yet, Galuf refuses to die. He fights on. Not for his kingdom, and not for his world, but for something far more precious. Galuf's last stand is a powerful scene because the battle plays out using the game's own combat system, and because we know the power of these magics. With each devastating spell that lands, we gain a greater appreciation for the strength of Galuf's conviction, the thing in his heart that keeps him standing, keeps him fighting. In a brilliant reversal of Tella's tragic end in Final Fantasy IV, Galuf fights not with anger or hatred, but with love. And even though he pays for it with his life, he is victorious. Because Galuf's sacrifice saves the heroes' lives and keeps the fight going. But the most beautiful moment comes in the aftermath. After trying everything they can to revive their fallen comrade, the heroes are left to accept the unthinkable, that their dear friend has passed on. And in a final act of paternal love, Galuf bestows everything he has, everything he is, onto his granddaughter. Kryl inherits the spirits of the crystals from Galuf's soul and gains all of her grandfather's experience and abilities. It's the perfect, bittersweet expression of love and grief.
and a final passing of the torch. For in that moment, Kryl's childhood comes to an end, as the last of the Dawn Warriors passes his torch to the fourth and final Warrior of Light. One generation giving way to the next. With only a few words, the game perfectly encapsulates the most bittersweet fact of life. That we must all one day prepare to be orphans. Before I go on, I just want to say if you enjoyed this video, I'd be super grateful if you could hit the like button and leave a quick comment, as it really helps the video reach more people. And if you want to support me, consider subscribing to my channel so I know people want to see more videos like this. The creation of Final Fantasy V was an attempt to make something that would bring together the best of two worlds. A world-hopping quest in the style of Final Fantasy III that also told a gripping, character-based story along the lines of Final Fantasy IV. The result was Final Fantasy's last great adventure. A game that bleeds the spirit of exploration. A more open-ended experience, where each player would use the unparalleled freedom of the updated job system to forge their own path. The last mainline game to feature the four elemental crystals and the Warriors of Light. One final chapter to close out the early days of Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy V was a great game in its own right, but today its legacy is mostly defined by what it is not. For better or worse, this style of player-driven adventure was not the creative path Square would eventually choose to walk. Future games in the series would once again downplay the freedom of character creation while placing greater emphasis on strong narratives and character-driven stories. At the same time, much of the intense criticism that modern fans direct at Final Fantasy V feels incredibly unfair. Because what the game lacks more than anything is really nostalgia. Final Fantasy IV and VI are both great games, but they get most of their praise from people like me who played them back in the day. Many Western fans have extremely fond childhood memories of those games, and we pass that enthusiasm to the people around us. Final Fantasy V doesn't get that. And while the game can be criticized for a lot of things, you cannot say it was a bad game for its time. Sure, Bart can be a bit of a doofus, but so can Cloud Strife. Yes, X death is ridiculous, but he's no more silly than Kefka. And Gilgamesh is a buffoon, but so is Ultras. Final Fantasy V might not have the heavy themes from Final Fantasy VI or the epic character arcs from Final Fantasy IV, but it was a milestone in storytelling and character interaction. It solidified the job system into a centerpiece of the Final Fantasy series, and it was a great adventure that deserves to be remembered. And for those of us who do have nostalgia for Final Fantasy V, the game represents a truly magical time in our lives. A time when the internet was only beginning to come into its right. A time when our horizons expanded in ways you cannot imagine if you weren't alive to see it happen. And for me, Final Fantasy V is a constant reminder of those glorious days of adventure. The final days of innocence and ignorance. Before a constant stream of Reddit leaks, YouTube videos and Twitter announcements revealed every single detail about upcoming games. A time when it was still possible to wake up one day and find a new Final Fantasy game you didn't even know existed. So to everyone who had even a tiny bit of involvement in getting the original fan translation of Final Fantasy V online, I personally thank you from the very bottom of my heart. In the end, Final Fantasy V is a story about an evil tree that fights a talking turtle to decide the fate of the world. And these are just my personal opinions. Whether you agree or disagree, I'd love to hear about your experiences with Final Fantasy V in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.